it's not about just pure performance as it is in other categories to be able to win. And that's why fans have a special passion for that sport because they see that there's so many factors. The only escape I could see as a good life, it was to become a racing driver. Because if you don't work with each other, you're not going to be there. And when you live with no regrets, uh, a race weekend, it means that you've done a good one. It empties you completely. I mean, it takes everything. I mean, there is no reward without risk anyway. The target in this championship for everyone is exactly the same. And it's winning the 24 hours of Le Mans. Hi. <laughs> the nose in between. <laughs> How do you get into a sport like that? Because, you know, when I was younger, if I came to my parents and say, hey, I want to do motorsport, I think my mother would have fainted in two seconds. So do you need to have a family in it to, to start it? Um, well, I think it's, it's probably different for every, uh, every driver that I know. Mm -hmm. um, as for me, it was pretty straightforward. I was literally born on a karting track. My parents on a karting track near Paris in Pontoise. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, yeah, my first baby seat was actually a, a karting seat. My mom didn't have time to buy uh, <laughs> the baby seat. It was pretty easy uh, for you? To, to get into the, into the business. Okay. And what about you, Nico? Pretty different, actually. Uh, I had no connection at all within family to motorsports. Much later than Joe Rick, for example, I was about 11, 12 years old when it all started. And um, it was purely a hobby that developed into much more later on. And your parents were not stressed about that? Not really. <laughs> Luckily, they had no idea what they were getting myself <laughs> and themselves into. And I never did go-karts. I participated in a race and I paid some of the, um, some of the professional karting or karting drivers mm -hmm. and so my dad said we should start karting um, and it was a hard adventure in the beginning because we didn't really have the budget and everything but then got quickly into it mm -hmm. did two seasons of go-kart and then I was already in uh, in formula cars okay it's family family driven um, okay. so my father was doing go-karts when he was very young uh, mm -hmm. I think he picked up the passion himself just by stumbling across it and then when I was very young he was doing Formula Ford, which was a very entry level from go-karts to race cars that um, mm -hmm. drivers all were successful and it got to the very top of Formula One and Le Mans and all these things. So I was around the racetracks with him racing. So it wasn't really a question that I want to do. It was when could I start? I would say for me, it was a, a little bit unexpected, let's say, how I, yeah, how I got into motorsport because my family was not at all involved in, in okay. racing in any way. Um, so my dad, he's an architect and he actually designed um, a go-kart track near where I was growing up in Belgium. Um, I was about five, six years old at that time. So I was kind of just going with him to his work. And um, yeah, he was friends with the owner of the karting track. And that's how I kind of got my first, uh, my first laps mm -hmm. in, um, in a kart. Obviously in the beginning, I didn't really know whether you know, I was gonna pursue that or 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 anything like that. I was mm -hmm. just doing it because I liked it and I was I was having fun. So um, yeah, I think um, started pretty young, a little bit unexpected. Mm -hmm. Tried a lot of different sports actually as well, um, but I, I I kind of knew that I didn't have the same passion that I had okay. uh, or the same passion that I had for uh, for the racing. I have to say that I think my father was even more passionate than I was. Okay, you know. And by seeing me in the go-karts, you know, then he offered me a go-kart and I starting to do that, you know, uh, you know, some, some days or, or weekends. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I started to, to love it, you know, and I loved, you know, the, that racing, that, uh, that speed feeling, you know, being solo uh, on the, on the ground mm -hmm. and, um, and fighting with the others, you know, that competition. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, that's how we, we started and, uh, here we are now. 
let's talk about the financial investment. Um, what I've learned about motorsport is that it's very expensive. We are talking about hundreds of thousands, even millions to build a whole career. Um, why? First of all, why is it so expensive? <laughs> There's many reasons, but uh, basically running running these cars already involves a lot of a lot of effort from mm -hmm. you know the teams that that run it there's i would say in, in junior categories you have up to three to four people needed to just run that car on a, on a high level to be able to compete at the front we are paying the teams as a as a young driver to, to get the seat in the team and and to race for them i said there is some compromises some teams they have partners they have possibilities to to partly fund uh, one or the other car within their team, but normally they try to have the drivers bring the budgets to allow them to race. And yeah. the, the faster the cars get, the, the, the higher you climb the ladder, mm -hmm. the more expensive it is for the teams to run those cars. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why the budgets, yeah, from season to season tend to, tend to increase. I mean, right at the beginning, I, I mean, I started like, like the guys and uh, mm -hmm. um, then I started to have a, a lot of support from the French Federation. Okay. Uh, which was, I have to say, uh, as a French driver, I mean, they, they've been really helpful uh, for a lot of us. Mm -hmm. uh, you have Formula One, French Formula One driver already, already uh, I mean, today uh, in F1 uh, because of the, the French Federation. So they, they've been really supportive. Uh, but it's been, it's been tough. I mean, uh, uh, even though it was not as expensive as now, uh, it, was, uh, it was a lot of money. Um, uh, and uh, my father was sometimes struggling. And I remember that my last year in, in go-karts, where to go and to be able to do the world championship, uh, I remember that he was selling the bicycles that we had in the garage mm. to be able to pay the, the, the set of new tires. It's, you know, your family pick you up and they see Every kid is special to your own parent, but when they see some spark in there, I guess you have to drive that passion through it. And they're the ones that make the journey happen. And I think they've got to take the benefit of it now. But um, I can honestly say now, if I'd started out with the family back and that we had it where we were, I wouldn't be sitting here now as a professional driver because mm -hmm. I would not have had the budget and the support to even get there, um, even with the contacts. And with um, this investment, with time and money from your family, investors, sponsors, um, I think it must bring a lot of pressure when you are young. Uh, was it too much sometimes for you to, when you understood what was going on with your career? There is obviously a lot of pressure in, in, in many aspects. For one thing is financial, but I think the most thing for me is the time we invest in this. You know, when you put education on the side, you put everything aside. So if you don't become a racing driver, you are, even from the first years of school, you're behind. Uh, I mean, I started later with racing, but, but you guys, you know, you miss school from the first day. So if you wouldn't be a racing driver, you would start to, you would have to redo all the educational part. You'll be 10 years behind. And we read all those books. Yeah, there's a lot to read. So it's, it's more all the sacrifices you do and invest in, in only the sport. So if it doesn't happen, it's a, it's a huge risk uh, that you take. Even early in my career when I was in Formula 3, Sebastian Vettel um, was my teammate. And he was trying to study when we're trying to win the Formula 3. He was trying to battle me for the Formula 3 championship and he's trying to study between sessions for his university degree. And I'm thinking, you know, where does that come from? How are you able to do that? But it was, it was family pressure. Okay. You know, it was on the other side of things. So I think every family is different in how they went about doing it. And I guess when you get to the top, you can share that. There's no right or wrong answer. It's mm -hmm. just how you are as a, an individual. The only escape I could see as a good life, it was to become a racing driver. To 16? Yeah, at one point. So, um, okay, you try to be as smart as possible. I mean, and you grow up also in an environment. Okay, it's not school, but still you learn a lot of stuff. But uh, yeah, I mean, at, at one point, uh, it's kind of a tunnel and you see at the end and the, the, that light and it's, that's what you have to achieve. <laughs> but there is no, re I mean, there is no reward without risk anyway. I mean, and when you learn to take risk at a very young age, it teaches you to deal with pressure better than anyone else. And uh, because pressure is something that we deal with our, our life. It changes, but the pressure stays the same for different reasons. But, uh, uh, you know, when you're young, you have the pressure that uh, if you don't win the championship, you're not going to have the funding and then you, your career stops there. But then when you are becoming professional, you also have the pressure that uh, if you don't perform, uh, it's going to be another one taking your place and uh, then you have nothing else. And then you have the pressure also from a manufacturer. Mm -hmm. uh, team is not going to take you just because you're kind to them or because they like you. They keep you and they pay you because you can bring them results. So you always have this 
this pressure to constantly perform, but since we deal with it since we are very young, it's kind of uh, normality. Okay. At some point, did you regret not having the same life as your friends, like the same freedom of movement and action? So you sacrifice a lot of things and it's the dream to become a professional racing driver. So once we've achieved that, I think it was all the sacrifice worth. But if we wouldn't have made it, obviously you would look back and, and you missed a lot of things. But mm -hmm. I think it's still, you know, all the journey we've been on, even if we wouldn't be here today, it's an education itself. Um, mm -hmm. You learn to, to stand by yourself, you travel a lot alone, you deal with all the people, uh, teams, partners. Um, so I think uh, you learn a lot from the whole journey as well. For me, I honestly think it's, it was one of my best experiences in life, okay. just because at a very young age you you have to be a grown-up basically mm -hmm. and you're spending time with um, with grown-up people mm -hmm. um, the people in the racing team and they're kind of teaching you uh, life a little bit let's say as well you know it's not only about the racing it's about how you behave around around the other people as well so uh, for me it was a great experience the good thing is that the outcome for us three and, and the six of us it's, it's positive mm -hmm. because at the end we've been able to uh, to, to race, uh, to do our passion, to, to earn money with our passion, mm. so the outcome is positive. But uh, it could have been the other way around and then the life is completely different. So, but yeah, then when, on the other side, when you're on your own at the end and uh, it's, it's a great experience, yeah, you have to deal with, uh, you know, when I moved when I was 16 to Italy, I didn't speak Italian, so mm -hmm. I learned Italian. Speaking with the guys to organize, you know, their travel, to take the train and the plane and stuff like that. So I think it's uh, in terms of life experience, there is nothing better than that. Well, when you have a goal and when you, you want to succeed in, uh, in something, uh, the things that you have to do, I don't call them uh, sacrifices, you know, it's, it's not even an option. So yeah, I'm, I'm very happy where I am today. So therefore, I, no, I have no regrets at all. And uh, yeah, for sure, I didn't have the same uh, childhood as, as all the other kids, but mm -hmm. I think I had a much better one. And uh, where I am today, I mean, uh, I think it's more the other one that regrets not to have done what I've done, you know? It was a life-building experience. It was fantastic. There was no mobile phones, Google Maps. <laughs> you know, no, but I'm being dead serious. You got to travel and you had to, you know, it was yeah, probably stuff or missed that. You had to be, you know, you, yeah. your, your family was thinking on a plane, 17. Mm -hmm. Germany, there was a map, had to do this. there's a map, you know, you, then that's how you got about when you first did it. Mm. Um, and I think you see the other side of it. And I think the most important thing, which I think it lacks nowadays, communication. You had to communicate with people. You had to talk to people. Yeah, it's not your you know, language. People weren't just like buried in a mobile phone. Mm? That's true. When I, when I take myself as an example, I think at the time you sometimes think, oh, it would be nice Friday night, Saturday night, go out and enjoy life with, with your 16, 17 year old okay. friends. But I think what we got out of that different journey is, you know, worth at least as much, if not, if not much more. And uh, yeah, sometimes I, I remember friends asking, ah, why you want to go to that uh, stupid racetrack again and uh, come out with us uh, and have some fun. And I, I would say, 100% no regrets on it and, and even at the time you're so driven you want to you want to make make your dream reality and there there has not been any point of uh, should I actually continue doing what I do and no questions asked okay what do you feel what is the sensation the feeling that you have when you are in in a car in the beginning in the beginning it's definitely kind of the the driving part and and you know driving as fast as possible basically okay. and and really like looking for finesse in in your driving like to master a braking master a corner um, that's really what kind of gives you that spark i think in the beginning of your you know the very bottom of your career um, and then you start competing with others and that brings a whole new dynamic because then it's about being kind of the best of everyone mm -hmm. and i think that's what is or has been driving me over over the past years is to yeah, to try and, you know, do that a little bit better than, than your opponents, basically, and to come out on top. <laughs> what about you? Yeah, mix of both. I mean, uh, uh, I agree with, uh, with Toff in, in, in his, yeah, about the, 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 the racing, you know, that, the, the speed also. Uh, but, um, uh, yeah, I'm more a racer, so I like, you know, side by side with the other car. <laughs> uh, you know, wanted to catch the guy in front of you and to go away from the from the guy behind, um, trying to be the best also and beat the others. Uh, 
I can feel also that in anything that I do, also when I play with my kids, you know, I mean, I will never give them, I will never give them a win. He has to pick up the win, you know, he has to beat me in anything where, you know, if we play football or whatever, but you can. He has to beat me, you know, if he's not good enough. Even he's four years old. Even he's four years old. I will never give him a win. No way. Uh, I, I love winning and um, I mean, he has to beat me. Um, that's why I, I still play a lot with them, but soon I will stop because they're going to they're gonna be too strong. Uh, but and they're going to beat you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it becomes, I don't know for you guys, but it becomes some sort of an automatism for us. I don't feel the speed anymore. I mean, I don't feel... Uh, maybe the first time I drove in F1, I, I felt, yeah, like, wow, the speed is incredible. But honestly, seriously, after two laps, the speed impression was gone. What I love is just the racing and the competition. Mm -hmm. That really, you know, what gives me the, the, the fire. I mean, the, the time, uh, the day at the end of my career when I stopped the racing, I don't think I'm, I'm going to drive anymore on, on tracks just because, yeah, the fire I have inside of me is pure racing. Personally, I also enjoy trying to optimize the car around you or you're driving around the car and understanding how you can get the extra few tenths out of it and I mean... For what purpose? To go quicker and to beat the others. That's what exactly. we're doing so it for. Competition. But I still enjoy that a little bit. Yeah, me too. And anything that can give me an extra tenth and that can make me do the pole position, I will, I will love it as well. Exactly. But that's <laughs> part of testing. That's what I mean. That's why we do it. That's why I'm motivated to go and do it too. At least for a few days. You know, I'm not the one that wants to drive in circles for a week. But as long as you feel like what you're trying to do and the understanding you're building for the car or, you know, the, the new setups that you're trying, they give you something extra, then I find it exciting. And I... I'm motivated to do it, but uh, the peak is clearly the racing, and that's um, yeah, what drives. But I think what makes racing so different to other sports mm -hmm. is that you're always in your zone. You know, when we drive for two or three hours, it's two or three hours without any mistakes. You know, that can kill a 24-hour race. Whereas in so many other sports, you have uh, so many breaks. You know, in football, you have an attack, and then you can relax, find your position. We we cannot do that. You know, we have the straight line speed, but even there, there's there's risk if we are not concentrated. So it's mm -hmm. like you get in a zone for so long where no other cross, uh, no other thoughts are crossing your mind. Mm -hmm. So you're just in your zone for two or three hours uh, without any disturbance. You know how important the, the job is that you do it right. So you don't even think about anything else. Okay. You said that you never feel fear during a race, right? I don't know if it's because of, uh, then it's fear for not performing. There's never fear of crashing because okay. it all happens so, so quick. And I also think that if you fear to crash, <laughs> you will never be a racing driver. These guys are already left behind doing karting or doing Formula 4 and they find something else to do. If you get to that point, you cannot have fear of, of, of driving or of crashing um, because the sport can be quite dangerous and you can get hurt when you crash with more than 300 kph. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There's nothing worse than to walk, especially if it's like your own mistake, which, which happens, unfortunately, it's going to happen. Uh, yeah, it happens at some point, like everyone has it even the best in the world. Um, and it's just the worst feeling to walk back to the garage mm. and yeah, having to say sorry to everyone basically, because they know, you know, they're gonna have a long, um, yeah, a long night ahead to repair the car. If you compare, you know, with Formula One, of course you have a team behind you, but if you crash, you know, like the driver championship, it's you. Okay. You crash, it's your mistake, mm. it's on your shoulder. Okay, there is the whole team, mm. so it's, it's bad for the whole team. But for us, you as, as the guy said, you know, I mean, when you crash, the driver championship is the three of us. Yeah. So when you come back, you know, that, that feeling that, okay, it's, it's, it's on me. I was driving the car and because of me, we, the three of us, not going to score any points. Uh, that's, that's something really, uh, that, you know, that, that feeling hurts a lot. Uh, uh, that's the only bit I would say that you have any, ever any doubt. At any point, you can't have any other thought when you're in the car, it's, you're zoned into where you are because it's, there's too much at stake um, for, you to, for your mind to be elsewhere. Okay. How do you succeed to find your stability, all of you, and find also a mix between your professional and personal life when you have, I mean, um, a wife, kids, relationships? When is the wife and kids coming to I That's <laughs> easy. It's easy. Deeper problem. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any problem. With yeah. girls, you know, I'm, but, I'm doing fine. Yeah. But you have an anecdote that you don't want to share with us. No, I <laughs> no, I don't have. But um, he's not scared to share the experience. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
No, I mean my my um, one of my previous girlfriends. She her family was involved in motorsports, so we mm-hmm. kind of got to know each other through um, through motor motorsports. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean that didn't continue. Um, but yeah, besides that, it's it's um, it's you know it's easy to meet people, easy to meet uh, you know to meet people these days. There's you know lots of uh, lots of tools for that. <laughs> but um, yeah, then again, it's the problem. At some point, you know, you you start realizing, um, you know, are they there for for the experience or do they really care about you? So I guess in in their case, it's it's easier because they. You know, they you guys. This, but they don't care anymore. No, it's yeah, okay. because the experience <laughs> is okay. <laughs> but yeah, it's you know they met before they even made it in 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 their racing career, and it turned out great. So you know that's that's all good. But I think yeah, if you haven't met someone kind of early on, then mm. it becomes it becomes a, a little bit tricky sometimes. Okay. Well, I think compared to a very normal job, or you know what what people might consider as normal when you maybe leave at 6.30 in the morning and mm-hmm. you come back at 5.30 uh, and you kind of have a bit of each other every day. I think we have a, a different lifestyle. We actually just talked about it this morning. It's quite funny. Um, that Or we are home 100%. Yes, you have your little bits and pieces to do, but still you're at home or you're fully gone. And, I, um, and it's a different lifestyle, but if I could choose, even just considering the private lives, I think the way we have it, once you get used to it, and especially, you know, your, your wife and your family gets used to it, um, there's a lot of privileges to it as well. If uh, if you're there 100%, you you know, you, you can actually plan half a day trip or, or a full day trip when you're there and, and really be there with each other okay. instead of, you know, just enjoying a couple hours before the kid goes to sleep. And mm-hmm. it's... You have to get used to it and organize yourself around around the job. But uh, I enjoy the days at home, I believe at least, more than I would if it was only these little pieces. Yeah, for sure. I can speak on, on behalf of Nico as well, but we are very fortunate to to have uh, you know partner that understand what we do and that support what we do. I think is the most important because without their understanding and their support, um, it would be very difficult because it's difficult for them as well. I mean, not to see them, for, not to see us sometimes for two weeks, three weeks, and uh, you know when the kid is asking about you all the time and uh, he wants to see uh, to see us, but uh, you know he, he can't. Um, it's 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 not easy, and um, yeah, having the full support is uh, is the most important really because uh, they they know that we need to focus on the, all the little problems of of normal life. I mean. We'll, we don't hear about them. They they, they handle it and uh, and uh, it's great. So. If we come back on the on the flights, uh, if there is something that could stop me from racing, mm-hmm. it's traveling too much. Okay. And now I don't do as much as I used to do before mm-hmm. because I just don't want to do it anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, because yeah, I mean uh, when you don't have uh, when you don't have a family, I mean okay, you have your suitcase, you go here and there. It's cool. You see people all around the world, you know. You experience different culture and stuff like that. But uh, but at one point, uh, for me, it was too much. Uh, yeah, it was too much. It was important, you know, to get the stability back. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, yeah, you don't. You, I mean, I feel like I don't know when it is. You know, some guys is gonna be some for some people is gonna be a 30 years old. For others, it's gonna be a 55, whatever. Mm-hmm. So this you don't know. I, I think it depends to to anyone. But I'm sure there is, at one point, there is something that, okay, being away 280 or 300 days a year, it's too much. So I think it comes at one point. Okay. For you too? Or do you enjoy more traveling? I definitely don't love to travel so much. You would like more time at home, but you get used to it. Um, but there's also nice parts of it, like the time in, in Paris, we can we have some nice dinners together, you enjoy the cities, you get around all over the world. <laughs> uh, sometimes we combine a race with a bit of holiday in a good destination. So there's benefits, but if you could remove the, the traveling part and just have a teleport putting you at the race and putting you back home, I think that would be the dream. Is there any like medical or psychological limits to become professional? Yeah, I think there is a medical checks to get your license to be approved to go and race from your national you do federation. I do it. I do it. <laughs> and color blindness is parts of it. Uh, yeah, corrected vision is, I think, not a problem, but it has to be, you know, done I think properly. If you make, uh, if, if, if you're like two meters high, that may be complicated for motorsport. The, the cars are 
not made for very tall people. So I think that's uh, one condition already. But they don't check like the psychology. It means if you have unstable or something no, like that. Be, they... Believe me, there will be many drivers that <laughs> wouldn't be competing <laughs> if they were checking that. This interview would be a bit less exciting. You would be by yourself. Yeah. Okay. I may not be able to raise it. <laughs> Neither do you. And do you work on the mental aspect of your work? Yeah. How do you how do you do that? The mental side is, I wouldn't say more important than any other thing, but it's as important. And uh, yeah, we have moments in, in motorsport that are very um, tough to, to react to. And uh, the most difficult thing being um, uh, whenever you have a, a phase of um, uh, not having any success, you know, failure to failure to failure. Uh, and losing your confidence, I think, is the, the, the most critical moment and the most difficult to get back into it and get back in your, you know, happy window of, of uh, operational side. And um, it's very easy to go from a crash, go back in the car, drive out again. It's, it's that's no problem. But when you go from failure and uh, when you start losing your confidence to gaining back, uh, it's, it's, it's not like, um, you know, I see some drivers sometimes struggling um, during a whole season and the second season and they start to doubt themselves and think that I'm not good anymore. But that's, that, that cannot happen. I mean, it's not like a driver that won championship or, or races. It cannot be bad again the year after. Mm -hmm. but there are things that makes him bad and, and those things are mainly and, and only on the mental side. So yeah, I feel, uh, I feel that it's very important to, to work on those things. You know, mental state, you're, the way mm -hmm. you, you feel about your own performance and rating what you have delivered on track. It's sometimes not so easy, especially if it keeps on happening. Mm. You know, if you have one bad weekend, okay, it's quite easy to digest. But if there's several in a row, uh, to not, you know, get into that downward spiral is is not so easy. So uh, I think that's that's one of the challenges that in motorsport is maybe a bit bigger than than in another sport where you as an athlete can be more in control of your own result. You may think that it's um, not a nice thing to be arrogant, mm -hmm. but it's in general. Uh, a very good protection to yourself and um, I mean yeah sure you need to be good to be arrogant I mean the, the drivers or the athletes that are arrogant and that don't have any results I mean those guys you know you don't <laughs> even talk to them it's it's not that's not a nice nice uh, those are not nice people but the successful athletes that are arrogant in general they are the one that get back into it very quickly after a failure okay. just because they are so certain of themselves they are so sure they are the best that whenever something bad happened to them, ah, it's not their fault. It's something else and, and they go back into it. And they have the notion of, so of understanding when they do something bad, they're able to really react also on themselves and, 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 and be able to, um, to be able to judge yourself and say, okay, no, this, this was bad, I have to change that. But still on the face of you know, everybody else, I'm still the best and uh, I'm still going to do it. So sometimes it may look very arrogant, but it's, um, yeah. Self-protection. Uh, yes, kind of, yeah. Uh, how is it to work with French people? How are we in the professional sphere area? There is a lot of, uh, and I think particularly in motorsport, you don't probably see the true reflection in the way, you, the outlook I think you see in France. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, I don't see it. I don't know what you think. I think it's a very different kind of way, the passion, um, the effort they can put in but they can be very detailed I think the biggest thing for me is how much the team has become a family um, and I, I think you, you see the ups and downs there's been a lot of downs and I think that's the important thing to say it's, it's not been straightforward this run the introduction going back into WEC and you know the success that they had with the 908 the 9x8 has been hard it's been hard work at the beginning it's taken more effort than probably people believed when they signed up to doing it um, and I think we saw a sense of relief what it could be by we, one of the cars achieved the podium last year in Monza and I think I saw a lot of emotion that I've never saw on a team and I saw something that you know you can build a journey um, I think especially with uh, with French teams um, the mechanics are great mm -hmm. like the, the the kind of relationship that they have and and um, you know, motivation they have is, is kind of quite uh, quite special. You know, they have, they're very good friends between themselves, um, and, and you can really feel that as well within um, within the team. They all uh, 
super happy to welcome us at the beginning. I you felt home. The marketing people behind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you you felt home um, very quickly in the Peugeot family with the mechanics and everyone. Um, you always hear that about the the, the French arrogance. Uh, mm -hmm. I haven't really felt it in the team. Just uh, just Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> You are the one so talking the about arrogance. It's the protection, it's protection. for <laughs> being the good driver, um, being able to perform. So it's um... <laughs> it's okay. They're happy if I perform well. It's for them as well, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it's it's been a great journey so far. It's great to see. You know, being a part of a French team in Le Mans is obviously very special. Mm -hmm. um, I was amazed to see last year doing the parade, all the French fans, it felt like they were all cheering for us because we were the biggest French team there. We have the history of, of three Le Mans wins. Mm -hmm. So um, everyone is there cheering for Peugeot and Le Mans. And uh, I think, yeah, it is going to be the same this year. So I'm super excited to go back. Yeah, and I think what you both touched on, this arrogance that is sometimes part of the reputation of, of, of maybe a French way of working. I experienced it a bit differently coming to Peugeot. Uh, I think uh, for you it was the protection mode. For me it was some 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 sort of. Um, I was not speaking for I, myself. I was speaking <laughs> for athletes in general. No, I know, I know. <laughs> but part of what describes arrogance for you was protection. And what I've experienced within the team was that uh, maybe you could define it as as a as an extra level of pride as well. Okay. Which which I found quite. Uh, Quite positive to experience it that way because um, many people were very very proud prouder than I've experienced in other teams or manufacturers to be working for that team and to represent those colors and to go out there and do their best for for this team and this brand. Uh, your team was created uh, for this championship. How do you succeed to create uh, like cohesion, communication? Because I, I can imagine that for your sport, you have to be very focused, very straight when you want to share some information. So how do you build this cohesion in this communication? I think first of all, between us drivers, friendship is super important. Um, and we always spend great time outside the track together, even with the other cars, so six guys. Uh, and, and now we have different lineups this year. And I think nobody really had a wish of, of who they want to ride with, because we all like spending time with each other. So uh, we go for uh, you know, dinners and, uh, and bars and stuff like that to try to know each other. No, but it's, uh, it's it's going to be new, so that's it's it's part of the success also. Mm -hmm. The way we're gonna we're gonna build that relation. I think it's uh, it's not that you have to be the best friends and go on holiday together, but I think it's important to have a really good relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna spend a lot of time together. Um, uh, you you go through uh, difficult times and good times. Of of course, having good times helps a lot. Mm -hmm. To build good relationships, uh, that's for sure. Do you know it's been a long time that you know each other? Yeah. Yeah? Do you know, can you like share some things that Maybe we... Maybe lose a European Championship in uh, when we were yeah, 18. The counter wasn't great. <laughs> team owned him in Barcelona. <laughs> you lost it? So I, I tried to overtake the car that was actually in between us. Uh huh. And it was one of my first big races, rookie, not really on top of what I was doing. And then I break a bit too late and I T-boned him. When was it? Uh, 2008. No, two, 2009. Nine. 2009. Of 2009. So what was your first impression of Nico? <laughs> A great one. <laughs> <laughs> I actually forgot it was him that tipped me. He told me like last year, I think. <laughs> we met from an S3. Almost five years uh, Four? Four. 20 years ago. Wow. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, there was that, that, that night in bad. Japan two years ago. No. That was nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, no. It's nothing that's going to make the old. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, we met 20 years ago. Uh huh. Um, for me, it was only one target trying to beat him. Uh, really? Uh, yeah, because he was always been part of the best ones. And, uh, you know, I mean, when you add that process, you know, the, the first categories, mm -hmm. I mean, you have to win if you want to achieve the goal, which is the, to be a Formula 1 driver. So you want to beat every, everyone. So he, he was never my teammate. Uh, he was in another team, but uh, it was Manor, I think. Pro the time, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so it's 20 years ago already. Um, and uh, and then stuff, which year did you do the uh, com campus? Oh, uh, 2010. 2010, so that's... Mm, yeah, so I mean, it's a, for me, he was a kid. <laughs> yeah, no, but really, it's like a little bit. Uh, it's different generation. So yeah. we didn't really race together. 
But Paul and I, yeah, so it's, it's 20 years ago and then uh, so Formula 3 and uh, also a bit in DTM. So I, I went to Japan, he went to F1, so I was watching him on TV. Okay. Uh, really jealous not to be uh, on the same <laughs> grid as him. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's, uh, you know, it's, it's also, you know, we are in a world that, you know, what goes around comes around, you know, and uh, basically, uh, you know, if you don't do Formula One, then there is that World Endurance Championship or something, you know, but at the end, yeah, you always meet people that, you know, since, since years. Uh, let's talk about the World Endurance Championship. Can you describe the championship to someone who doesn't know about it and how is it a different challenge from other races? Yeah, I think the word endurance and World Endurance Championship, it says all that it's all about long distance. Um, mm -hmm. It's not about just pure performance mm -hmm. as it is in other categories to be able to win. You need to work as a team. Uh, there's so many members in the team. Pit stops need to be perfect for 24 hours, uh, which is the case at Le Mans. Um, you need different type of drivers to, to learn from each other and, and strengthening the crew. Um, you see the, the best lineups that have won Le Mans, it always consists of some younger drivers on the way up because they come with new energy to the team, but there's also the experienced one that can teach the others how mm. to protect the car, how to work with the team, the setup, because um, there's so much other aspects than just trying to be, be fast on track. Yeah, I mean, and Andres as well as uh, your, your three drivers to, to share the car. And sometimes uh, what I would like to have as a setup to be really fast may not be the right things for my two other teammates. So you may have to make a compromise in the setup. You know, you're not going to be as comfortable or as fast, but if it works better for the two other drivers, then it's what needs to be done. Mm. So endurance, you kind of put your ego on the side and really think about your team first. And um, yeah, it's uh, the only category I think in, in motorsport that is like that. Just for you to understand is that that Le Mans race is, is like a final of World Cup for us. It's the ultimate test as well. It's happening, it's happening once a year. Mm -hmm. The full team is working for that. Mm -hmm. So if you don't achieve it, you have to wait one year mm. to get the opportunity again. Mm. So it's a big challenge for a lot of people. <laughs> what you have to understand also, if, it's, if you compare to Formula One, 24 hours race, it's almost like a full championship in terms of kilometers distance that the Formula One is going to do. So in one race, we're going to do like, I don't know, something like 20 races in F1, you know, so okay. for, to achieve that, you know, for, for the car. It's roughly mm -hmm. like 6,000 kilometers, I think, isn't it? The winner. Yeah. Yeah. So for, for the car, it's, it's a proper challenge. But what I love about it, it's, and, and the, the feeling is that it empties you completely. I mean, it takes everything, you know, to be ready night and day, spot on, flat out because it used to be an endurance race where you had to take care of the car, the brakes, the engine. Mm -hmm. Now the winner, it's, it's like doing a sprint of 24 hours because anyway, the guy who's going to win, I mean, the car that's going to win, mm -hmm. is going to do a sprint. So you have to be spot on, flat out from the, from the, the, the green light to the checkered flag. So that's something, it's really intense for the car, for the mechanics, everybody is empty. Everybody is crying at the end of the race, you know, because it takes so much of emotions, you know, and, and that's really for me something really special about about Le Mans, about this race, because, you know, either for the car or for, for the humans, it's it's exhausting. It takes everything out of you, and uh, this is what I love about it. You know, shared success, uh, I tend to say, is, is nearly more enjoyable than an individual one, and that's why I think we love endurance racing. I think that's why fans have a special passion for that sport because they see that there's so many factors uh, influencing whether you're successful or not that uh, it, yeah, it has a fascination. And how do you prepare uh, for this kind of race? Because uh, you can drive during six hours, 10 hours, 24 hours. So it's very long. Um, I mean, I have stupid question, but it's not that stupid. How do you prepare? Like, do you drink less before um, before race? Do you eat less? Do you sleep more? How, how do you prepare your body to uh, start to um, to stay longer in in the car? Um. Well, I think it's a, it's a long-term preparation um, um, that starts, you know, already many years ago with all the work that you do in the, in the preparation on the physical side. Um, you obviously tend to do 
more endurance work. Um, so like longer runs or longer um, cycling session or hiking the mountain for like a few hours. And, uh, you know, really getting your heart and your body used to walk for a long time. Um, and then during the week, you're trying to preserve your energy as much as possible because although it's a race that lasts 24 hours, it's actually more than a full week of work. So we're already there 10 days before for the private testing and then you got a lot of uh, media activities. Then you got another testing during the week and then you got the qualifying at night and then you got the driver's parade that lasts four hours and uh, you know, it's, it's very uh, uh, energy sucking uh, to be with all the, the people for, for the whole week and uh, you know, with the pressure mounting up. Um, you already uh, arrive on Friday night before the race, you're already dead. And then you wake up, it's, it's okay now, it's, it's the big work to do. So it's a lot of work of how to manage your energy during that week. Mm -hmm. Obviously you want to try to have a, a very good sleep on, on Friday because that's the last good one you have mm -hmm. uh, for you know, the next 36 hours. And um, then during the race, it's, uh, it's quite simple. I think you drive, you exit the car, you debrief, you go eat, little massage, little shower, you go sleep for an hour, an hour and a half. Then you during go back the race? The yeah, yeah, during the race. Okay. So even though you can't, I mean, some drivers don't even sleep, some drivers, they have no problem to sleeping, but you know, with the, the, the pressure being so high and the, the, the tension and the, the whole thing, it's very hard to find, uh, you know, to find sleep, even though you're, you're very tired. So you kind of yeah, just relax and if you're able to sleep, you sleep. But uh, yeah, you don't sleep uh, a lot during that race. Okay. Then you go back out uh, again to do the same. And the difference to so many other sports is that you have a game, a match or a performance of two hours and then you have a week till your next match. We jump out of the car and then in four hours you gotta get in again and get beat up and then you get out. And it's the same, four or five times during a race. Yeah. So you do five games or five matches in one, in, in one race of 24 hours and you're just completely done when, when it's all over. And you cannot rely on your break being, you know, the actual break that you initially planned for because the race is, is evolving constantly. You have to be flexible. Maybe suddenly your four hour so you break. You cannot rely on your break, like uh, breaking the cows, you know, calipers. No. This one, hopefully you can. <laughs> yeah, hope you can but I mean, the, the four hour break, you know, that you usually have because we, in a normal race, we do two hours and then we swap. Mm -hmm. But sometimes the race evolves and it changes and you already have to get back, get back in after three. So your break gets much, much shorter or suddenly somebody stays in three or four hours instead of two. So it gets longer. And, you know, it's not like you, you get out of the car, you put your, your alarm for two and a half hours later and that's going to be what it is. You have to, to stay flexible and that also, you know, impacts your, your stress level mm -hmm. during the break because you don't really know Rest. what's going what's gonna to be next. And uh, yeah. It's, it's definitely energy consuming. One thing that surprised me, I never thought about it that way, but one time I used my, my sports watch to, to track the two hour stint. When you get out, it says, okay, you need to rest for 17 hours. <laughs> <laughs> but you do another four times two hours in, in the next 24 hours. So it's, it's completely extreme what, what we're doing in the in Le Mans. What is your goal as a race driver, but also as a person, as a human being? I think the sporting goal is pretty clear for us. We want to win Le Mans with Peugeot. Mm -hmm. And that's the that's a dream. I mean, it's a French team, French race, and everything that comes together, if that could happen. And as we said, the thing to be able to win as a team, as three drivers together, it's just emotionally different because you have to share it with someone. Um, rather than it's more egoistic own performance with your team. So that will be the, the sporting thing for me. Well, you want to win Le Mans. I think that's, mm -hmm. that is the main goal and the main objective when I signed up to this team and that's what they told me, that's what they want to do. So as the question to any racing driver, the goal is to win. So in general, when you do the, all the hard work with your team, with yourself, um, that you do everything correct on the race weekend, you, you generally never leave um, with no points, you know, so um, mm -hmm. and when you leave with no regrets uh, a race weekend, it means that you've done a good one. I mean, winning Le Mans, yeah. for, sure, for sure. I mean, I, I've had the chance to win it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd love to, to win it again and to, mm. to pause, you know, for, for a few seconds and mm. to, to, have that, to have that feeling. Uh, th that's... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Stop. <laughs> uh, that's uh, targets uh, and it's, it's a great challenge.
It's super difficult to overcome the challenge, but uh, when, when you can make it happen, uh, you go on that podium and there is like 200 and something thousand people. And you are Robbie Williams. And you are Robbie Williams. <laughs> <laughs> Jackpot. I agree. That's the big race. Uh, we're currently in a golden era of the sport as well. You know, the, the top class in, in Le Mans is, is in a big hype at the moment. There's a lot of competition. So mm -hmm. a win during this era, I think, uh, especially for us being, you know, living this era now, uh, would mean even more than, than it m might if there's less competition. Because uh, if you beat the, the strongest one out there, it means even more to you. So uh, that's the big, big goal. And uh, yeah. Hopefully, rather sooner than later. The target in this championship for everyone is exactly the same. And it's winning the 24 hours of Le Mans. Mm -hmm. Because it's probably the biggest race in the world, or one of the biggest, at least, in the world. It's what the drivers, it's that one race that every driver wants to win. And it's what every manufacturer wants to win. That's ultimately why they're there. I know it consists of a lot more races um, over over the season, over the year. But ultimately, that's kind of the main target for everyone, is to win that one race. Thank you for your time and for answering the question. I hope you will have a successful year with uh, Peugeot. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. That was an endurance. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? I want the journey for hours. <laughs> what time is it? It's only 4 p.m., two hours. It's two stints. It's two stints. Two points in the car. So I really felt the two hours, huh? What did you say? You felt the two hours? No, no, come on. Good one. <laughs>